Hi, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and welcome to Psycho Bible, Babbling About Psychology and Theology. And I'm happy to have on today two guests uh, as I'm doing my series of interviews with seasoned ex gay veterans. Uh, one of them is a little more seasoned than the other. Uh, <laughs> but as I've mentioned previously, I also have a, an angle in this series of interviews to uh, discuss the future of things and uh, the next generation, how we're passing on the torch in different ways. And so I'm happy to have on two of the leaders within Transformation Ministries Alliance, Daniel Mingo and Derek Paul. Uh, Daniel, I've actually had the honor of having you in my co counseling coaching or counselors coaching cohort that I've been leading for the past five months with Restory Ministries. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, for being part of that. And uh, Derek is also on the board of directors with me with Voice of the Voiceless. So I've been honored just to work alongside him in different ways. Uh, looking forward to actually meeting you in person finally uh, this coming month in June at the conference coming up. So uh, let me just start off with Dan. I want to hear a little more about your background, but first give us a spiel about who you are, what you do, the name, uh, your ministry, what you guys do with Abba's Delight, and just give us a little elevator pitch of uh, introduction. Great. Thank you. And by the way, I'm really glad you are coming to the conference, Andrew. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm honored. Um, so about me, um, my name's Daniel Mingo. Um, I am turning 71 in less than a week. Right. Uh, actually, no, it's a week from today. Uh, June 6th. And uh, uh, I have been a born-again believer since I was 17. I'll get into a little bit of that in a moment. Um, I am married. We will celebrate to my wife, Fran. We will celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary this coming November. Um, I have three adult sons, all who were raised in the church, and uh, they're spread out uh, along up and up and down the East Coast. Uh, I have one in New York City and two in Florida, one in Clearwater and one down in South Florida near Fort Lauderdale. Um, so. Uh, I started uh, Abba's Delight Ministry in 2008, and then I founded the Transformation Ministries Alliance Network during COVID in 2020. Okay. And where are you located again? Uh, in I'm based in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. I'll, I'll sort of be fairly close to you when we do the conference. Yes. And can you just describe a little bit what you do with Abba's Delight? What sort of offerings do you guys have? Um, with Abba's Delight, um, I uh, do lay counseling with the individual members. Uh, I do a support group called our Overcomers Group that meets once every other week. And then I also have a uh, family and friends support group that currently meets once a month. And then uh, I also uh, send out a newsletter by email. Uh, I started doing that um, actually the year the ministry started in 2008, and I write an article for each newsletter. Uh, I just published the the uh, May newsletter over the weekend when I had a bit of time to write that article. Um, I do speaking engagements. Uh, I love to go into churches to talk about God's redemptive power and the homosexual's life. Um, I love to go to some political events. Uh, I've spoken before the state uh, legislature committee that was uh, has been trying for the past several years to push a conversion therapy ban. Mm. Uh, and uh, any, uh, any opportunity I get to talk about what God's done in my life, but also what God can do in, in an LGBTQ person's life, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump at that opportunity uh, as the spirit is leading uh, because the church hasn't heard enough testimonies. Mm -hmm. Well, actually that's a good segue. So let's get into it. What, what is your testimony? My testimony. I was brought up in a Catholic home. So I had a basic understanding of the Christian faith. Um, I uh, felt for 
most of my growing up time that that I was a misfit, an outcast. I, I didn't feel loved by my family or or kids in school. Um, I was the uh, oddball arts guy. Um, I could excel in singing, dancing, acting, performing, uh, but I sucked at sports. And uh, and the failure of trying to fit in with the other guys doing sports only uh, heightened and highlighted the fact that I really did suck at sports. Um, I was molested at 13 by a man I did not know. Mm. And uh, that combined with uh, not having a good relationship with my dad or male peers kind of put me on a solid trajectory towards uh, a life of, of living in homosexuality. Um, I did that for 30 years, but it was a secret life. I never adopted a gay lifestyle. I never wanted to uh, uh, adopt uh, a gay identity. I just hid in the secret that I had, didn't tell my parents, didn't tell anyone uh, until after I got born again. I got born again at 17. It's actually a product of the 1970 Asbury revival. Mm -hmm. I was a senior in high school, and the revival was part of the larger Jesus movement at the time that was sweeping the nation and the world. Okay. Um, I got born again, spirit baptized, uh, and thought, believed that God was going to take away my same-sex attractions. He did not do that. Um, so I lived still in the secret, trying to overcome those attractions. And all the while, I was hooking up with guys secretly. My desire was to get married and have a family. So at the age of 18, I started looking for my wife. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't come along until I met her when we were 30. Uh, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't tell her about my same-sex attra attractions either. I was too scared. Uh, yet all the while, even, even walking in the power of the Spirit and, and ministering in the gifts, um, I couldn't by myself. Um, get away from the power that hooking up with men had over me. Mm. Um, it wasn't, we got married in 1983. It wasn't until 10 years into our marriage that uh, after having acted out again on a business trip with someone, uh, my ritual, and I didn't realize it was a ritual at the time. I didn't realize I was in a, I was in a uh, uh, an addictive behavior yeah. pattern at the time. Uh, my ritual was crying out to the Lord on the way home from these business trips and asking him to take, take it all away. Uh, and the thing that the Lord broke through into my spirit on this one particular trip was it Daniel, it's time to tell Fran. Mm. And I knew that was the Lord because I knew the, the devil wasn't going to come along and say, okay, you can quit sinning now. So I knew that was God telling me that I needed to do that, but it scared me because I had given her civil and biblical reasons to end the marriage because of my acting out. And so uh, the first thing I did was I went to a pastor and told him about my my same-sex attractions. Well, I had actually already told him when we moved to Louisville, but I had led him to believe that that my acting out was a thing of the past. And so uh, we prayed about that, and I asked him to forgive me for not being honest with him. Uh, and we prayed for a few weeks to make sure that it was actually the Holy Spirit's direction to tell her. We got back together and said, yes, this is what God is saying to do. 
And then we prayed again for three more things, that, that the Lord would prepare my wife to hear my confession, prepare her heart to hear my confession, that I would know the right time and I would have the right words to share with her. We got back together again in another few weeks. I said, I believe it's time. And uh, we got a babysitter for our three sons who had, who had been born in, within that 10-year period. And uh, I took her out to dinner and I shared with her uh, what, what my life was like. I shared with her about growing up in my home, how difficult that was. I shared with her about getting molested. I shared with her about, you know, having, having this thing that I couldn't seem to break uh, of acting out with other guys and uh, told her that I knew I needed help but I was stuck. I was caught and I didn't know what to do. Uh, the Lord had prepared her heart. She forgave me. Um, she, she talks about it. Um, I love doing these kind of interviews with her because I, I, she, she speaks so well of how God used my dysfunction in bringing healing to her own uh, self-identity issues and, and her own uh, the, the the issues that she had in her life uh, that she, the Lord was able to heal through the things that I was going through and and it through my recovery process. So uh, she did forgive me. We realized at that time I was dealing with a sexual addiction. That was in 1993, so I'm in my 30th year of recovery from sexual addiction. Um, walked away from porn and hooking up, and it took me another 10 years to get free from masturbation um, because the guy who molested me, that's what he taught me to do. And, and it took some more time to get free from that completely. Um, and then... Uh, 21 years into my sobriety, when my mom passed away, I blew that 21 years of sobriety from porn. Mm. Um, had to find, that was in 2014. So leaving, leaving those behaviors in 93 was a lot different than leaving them in 2014. And so I, I got stuck for a while again. Mm. Um, the Lord called me into ministry in 2003, uh, speaking to my heart, saying, I'm putting you into ministry now. I was 10 years into my recovery process. He said, I'm putting you into ministry now because there are men coming along behind you who need to know my redemptive power in the homosexual's life. And so for the first four and a half years, I was the branch director here in Louisville of an Exodus International ministry that had been going since the 70s, uh, based in Lexington, Kentucky, where I grew up. Which ministry was that? Uh, it was called, oh my gosh, what was it called? It was called um, Crossover Ministries. Okay. Um, I stayed as the branch director until December of 2007 and um, resigned that staff, staff position then. Uh, the new director was kind of taking it into some wonky directions and um, my inclination was that I cannot stay connected with this ministry because of where that person was taking it got some counsel from other Exodus ministry leaders that, that I was connected to over the years, talked to my own pastor, and we decided in December of 2007 that I would resign my staff position. And between then and after Easter of 2008, uh, my wife and I and my pastor and his wife would be praying and asking the Lord what he had next for me. And so almost immediately after that time, uh, the Lord began unfolding to me that he wanted me to start a ministry based here in Louisville. 
And that ministry is Abba's delight. Um, because when I got when I got born again at 17, during the Jesus movement, and one of the hallmarks of the Jesus movement is Jesus is coming back any day. Mm. I didn't stay in college, and I never got a degree. So when it came time to start Abba's Delight, I didn't know anything about starting an organization. I didn't have a business degree or anything like that. I was just following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. so the Lord gave me the name Abba's Delight. He told me who to go to to see about getting Abba's Delight, become a, um, a nonprofit ministry. Um, he told me how who to see about uh, starting different things that, that the ministry was going to be doing. And so within the first six months of starting Abba's Delight, we had an overcomers group that was meeting weekly. Um, we had become a 501c3. I had a bank account. I had a PO box. I was publishing the monthly newsletter by email. Um, and that was one of the biggest challenges because I am probably the least tech savvy person you've ever met in your life. <laughs> I am known worldwide for my lack of tech savvy, um, but I got help with that. And in the eighth month, we started our family and friends support group. Um, back in those days, you had to be you had to be in existence for a year before you could even apply to be an Exodus ministry. Okay. Um, and I applied as soon as as soon as I was uh, available, uh, allowed to do that. And most they they told us in the instructions that. Um, you would once you got your application date, which was after you had everything sent in and they had a chance to review it, you got an application date. And then it could be a year to two years before you could be approved. Um, once I got my application date, I was approved in 10 months. And so in, in 2010, I became an Exodus member ministry and stayed involved uh, as a ministry. Um, until it closed in 2013. After 2013 closed, um, I'm getting into some of the other questions now. After yeah. 2013, yep. Exodus closed in 2013, that's when the network Hope for Wholeness started. Yeah, oh. let's, so let's take a break from that. We'll okay. pick up on that a little bit in uh, our next set of questions. All right. Um, but let me circle back to just the fact that you're getting involved in ministry. Um, one of the angles also that I want to use this series of interviews for is also to encourage those who've experienced the goodness of God to be in a, a conduit of God's grace to others. And you could have, you know, after you came to your pastor, you fessed up to your wife, she forgave you, you did counseling, you, you got you got restoration yourself. You could have just went on and lived a quiet life and just, well, hey, that was an experience. What is it that got you started with just not stopping just there with your own healing and redemption, but ministering to others? Andrew, early on in my Christian life, I realized that I'm not here just to get saved. I'm not here just to do things. I'm here because God has a destiny, not only on the, on the bride of Christ, on the, on the overall church, but God has a destiny that he has hand-selected and hand-picked for each individual member of the body of Christ. So I've been all about discovering what that destiny is for me. Hmm. And so part of that destiny was to get recovery, get healing, start Abba's Delight, and then later on start TMA. And... An expectancy that God has something for me. Yes. It's not just to, to live a regular life. Yes, exactly. And that's just not for me. I'm, 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 I'm not a leader 
because God told me to do these things, we have the potential for leadership in the body of Christ. We all have great things to accomplish as part of our destiny in Christ. It's just some of us don't even know to look for it. Some of us don't even know to seek him for it. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm going to move over to Derek in a moment. I just also want to, well, let me just comment on that first. I think what you just there said there is so powerful because um, one of the things I think that prompted me to get involved in ministry is uh, I think about the old Rich Mullins song, Brother's Keeper. And, you know, when, when Cain killed Abel and God goes and confronts Cain, he's like, where's your brother? And he asks God, Rhetorically, who am I? Am I my brother's keeper? Mm -hmm. The implied answer is yes, you're responsible to your fellow brothers. And for me, it was when I experienced my own healing in my own history of sexual brokenness and my own self-esteem issues and self-worth issues. And I was I went into college on fire with the knowledge of my identity in Christ. And I just couldn't shut up about it. But then I started seeing others, my friends and acquaintances that I was just get, starting to get to know who were struggling and there was no help. Yeah. And I can't just be quiet and can't just keep that to myself, that God has helped me in some areas. It may not have been a same-sex attraction, but there's other areas of brokenness that God has helped me in. I mean, that's what motivated me to become a therapist anyway. But beyond that, I have a responsibility, a duty to do more. And it just... Some of it, even with your own story, it seems like happenstance. That's where God directed you this way, but you still had to have that expectancy that God has a plan for me. And it's not just to get my hell insurance and live a comfortable life. Yes. It's to, there's a great adventure with being a Christian. Uh, so I think what you're sharing exemplifies that. I remember sitting in an Exodus conference probably 2009, 2010, before uh, Abba's Delight became an Exodus ministry. And I so badly wanted to be up there praying for the people who were coming forward. And I couldn't. I had to wait. I had to be patient. It was really hard for me. Well, in his timing. Yeah. Now, maybe in his timing... He will also grant you some tech skills. Because <laughs> I can second that. When you sent me this one email, and I'd never seen it before. It was like broken into three different columns, and the words are split up in different parts of the column. I'm like, I, and you had no idea how that happened. <laughs> so, so yeah. yes, uh, I, I can second that claim that you are notorious with tech. Derek, let's, let's hear from you a bit who you are and, and about uh, your ministry, identify. Um, so let's get the, the basic introduction to who you are and what you do. Sure, yeah. Um, and thanks for having us on today. It's we're I'm assuming for Daniel and I, um, it's wonderful to be on Psycho Bible with you. And um I just appreciate the opportunity. It's great. Um, so yeah, I oh Lord help. Um, so I'm married, I've been married now for 17 years. I have three kiddos, 10, 9, and 7, and um, I've run Identify Ministries for nearly a decade now, and on the board of Voice of the Voiceless, as you said, and um, am the network director for the Transformation Ministries Alliance. Um, I'm a homeschool dad and a homesteader and um, a former um, choreographer and cheerleading coach and, um, and was really big into the arts. So um, kind of my old life, in a way, um, was very much um, noted with that industry, within the competitive cheerleading industry. Hmm. And um, yeah, so we're kind of living our best life now. Um, my How wife- you find the time? Oh my gosh. I already knew you, you got Identify, you got TMA, uh, yeah. but you're homeschooling and you're a homesteader? Yeah. Man. <laughs> we, we each have our chores. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we call it the- the Paul family team. And so we kind of run everything like a team sport. Um, 
but yeah, we all work together and yeah, it's an interesting ride. I'll say that for sure. Yeah. And where, where are you guys and, and, uh, identify located? Sure. Identify is based out of Gainesville, Florida, which is smack dab in the top half of Florida. And we cover everything from like Valdosta down Lakeland, Orlando, Tampa on up North and then over to Tallahassee, over to Jacksonville. So um, Identify provides accountability and discipleship for overcomers who have decided to leave LGBTQ, um, who are Christian. We provide accountability for six months. We help people get plugged into a local church, find three to five people in their local church or their life that God has planted there to be their accountability. And then we disciple their accountability as well in that six months. And then after six months, um, people return on an as needed basis um, to talk about things and uh, in the next season of whatever they're going through. And uh, we have two parents groups. Um, one is local to Florida and one is um, local to Pennsylvania. And then oh. um, I provide um, trainings and workshops mainly for Christian organizations to learn how to minister more effectively um, in the LGBTQ space. So pregnancy centers, um, churches, things in that sort of realm. That's what Identify does. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So let's get into what, what's your own story. Sure. Well, um, I was born into a Methodist preacher's family and um, in the Florida conference. And um, I didn't find this out till I was about 20, um, but I was born two months early, two pounds, nine ounces and stillborn. And uh, my mother was having a grand mal seizure. So they were really focusing on her. Um, but I had this really sensitive nervous system. And my parents would talk about the first three or so years of my life, how they couldn't hold me because mm. I would hold my breath or I would scream. Um, and, and so we had this dynamic in our family. Um, and I guess this does happen with other premature uh, babies where their nervous system is so sensitive that they can't be held. So at about four years old, my parents discovered that one of my testicles hadn't dropped. And um, I went through examinations and they realized um, it was still inside of me. Um, and those examinations, I can briefly remember them. Um, my parents were kind of wallflowers in the room and there, there was this guy in a white coat that's kind of prodding me down there. And, um, and then I ended up having this surgery. So I had a lot of things early on in life with um, not being held and then having this exam. Um, and then I started fantasizing about being held about the age of four years old. And um, my dad was, uh, he was working a lot as many pastors do. And my older sisters and mom were around me a lot. And I started fantasizing about being held by an older guy and it became eroticized. Um, I was picking up some of the mannerisms and uh, ways of speech of my mom and sisters. So by the time I was in kindergarten, um, I was pretty effeminate. And even my best friend would be like, were you supposed to be a girl? Were you supposed to be a girl? Um, and so I had some of those questions. I still remember thinking, you know, maybe I, maybe I was like, maybe God messed up on me. Um, and when I was six, I got involved in competitive gymnastics and my coach in order to push me, um, he thought that I would work harder if he would call me a girl's name. So for about a year, he called me Paula and, um, unbeknownst to my family. And I really felt like you know, I really didn't measure up. I was never going to be this boy that um, that measured up in gymnastics, that measured up at home, that measured up at school, and maybe God really messed up on me. And I was eroticizing male touch and affection at the same time. So um, that was a big part of my story. And at eight years old, I actually came to Christ because I knew the way that I was um, feeling and thinking about men was inappropriate. And, um, and I needed the Lord. 
uh, we had this evangelist come to our little church in South Florida. And um, I still remember him saying, if you need God to help you with something no one else can help you with, um, come and ask the Lord into your heart. And I stood up. I had this supernatural encounter with the Lord in this little Methodist church in Fort Pierce, Florida. And um, I knew something had happened. Um, and for a couple of years, I didn't have any same sex attraction, but nothing else had changed. Our family dynamic was the same. And, um, and my family really kept that specific situation under wraps, you know, especially in the Methodist church. Mm-hmm. So, um, man, when I hit puberty, it was like, everything came back with a vengeance. The intensity of the same sex attraction was so much, um, it was more frequent and, um, and the dynamic was still there. So I actually didn't even tell anyone that I had been dealing with this until the day my dad retired from the ministry my senior year. And um, my parents had no idea what to do. Um, they were kind of reeling from their own transition, leaving the ministry. And um, for a few years, I really didn't share much with anybody what had gone on. And I was in the competitive cheerleading world from about seventh grade through college. Mm. Um, and so that industry is very sexualized. Um, and there were a lot of situations. Uh, I went to a performing arts high school. So I really got to see what the gay lifestyle was like um, as a child. And it was one of the reasons why I didn't want to come out. I was very nervous that what was happening to my friends after a few months of coming out would start happening to me after a few months of coming what out. Was that? Um, well, a lot of them would, um, you know, have to go for STD tests or they would start, and this was in high school, they would start experiencing depression, really severe depression. A lot of them became like a very, very gender nonconforming within a short period of time. and. Um, I just thought, gosh, if I go into this, and a lot of them had many sexual partners, even in high school. So I thought, if I get involved in this, I may never make it out. You know, I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to have a lot of sexual partners. Um, I don't want to have to go for STD testing. I mean, back then, especially, that was in the late 90s, um, early 2000s, that STDs were like a very scary thing, especially back then. Um, I just did not want that. And I had this inner sense of, especially being in theater, you know, we always had to play a role of somebody else. And I really just wanted to feel good in my own skin. So going to a performing arts school really pushed me to realize I didn't want to pretend to be anybody else. I just wanted to be authentically myself. Um, And it helped me in a way not escape. So yeah, I ended up um, sharing with some people in college and Christians and eventually shared with a woman in our college and career group named Chantel. And when I told her that I I lied to her, I was planning on going into the gay lifestyle, but Mm -hmm. I'm a planner. So I was planning for a year of what I was going to do. And um, when I told her, that I wasn't planning on going into the lifestyle that I had just been dealing with these attractions. And she was the first Christian who said to me, um, you know, God can do anything. What have you done about it? I had never had a Christian make me responsible. Like I, whenever I would tell a Christian, they'd always say, I love you no matter what. Thanks for Mm -hmm. being so brave. And that was always nice, but then they would never follow up. And, um, she actually started getting videos, testimony videos sent to her, like she would pull them up on her computer and then ask me to come over and I would watch them. So I would watch, you know, Dennis Jernigan and Stephen Bennett and these other people that had already put their testimonies out. I thought, gosh, these guys have children. Um, they have beautiful wives. They seem to have a really great relationship with the Lord. Um, Even if I get halfway there, that would be amazing. Uh, Anything's better than this, (laughs) you know, Uh, just the attractions themselves were so terrorizing for me that I just couldn't imagine um, being completely lost in the life. 
So yeah, that was kind of the beginning of finding resources. And um, I started developing feelings in my body for this woman, Chantel, still unable to picture her in a sexual way, but starting to feel these feelings. And um, we began, we began dating, we were prayerful about it. Um, and a year later, we got married. And I honestly, I mean, mm. I'm grateful that the Lord provided that. I don't know if I would have made it without her. Um, however, I did not have any healing yet. Mm. And, um, and so it made the first few years of our marriage very difficult. But um, yeah, five years into our marriage, we kind of hit rock bottom. And the Lord showed up for us in a very dramatic way. And um, so it was in a 2010. Um, and yeah, the, there was a, a spiritual oppression that I was under. I was very confused. Um, I de started to develop my relationship with the Lord, but I was um, so double-minded. I would not let this, this fake life that I had never lived go. And the Lord really put it before me that I had to let this life I was not living go. And so um, that was the beginning of a radical transformation <laughs> in my life. Um, I actually remember I was in a support group at the time. And I had confronted some of the guys in the group because it seemed like we went from, you know, being gay to ex-gay. And I really wanted to feel good in my marriage. I really wanted to have dreams and a vision for the future. And they weren't on the same page with that. And one of them actually was like, I don't think you need to hang out with this anymore. I think you need to hang out with like married guys with kids. Cause I think God has more for you than what we are looking for here. Wow. And um, so I kind of got kicked out of the ex gay community and um and i started investing for two two and a half years into men in my church who never dealt with this and that was such a healing time in my life mm. um, it was a challenging time but one of the best things that had ever happened to me and i think it's um, really important what what god did there because yes. there are times where the ex-gay community becomes like an ex-gay ghetto or not even an ex-gay community but like the uh same-sex attracted Christian community. Yes. It's like their own little world. And uh, sometimes it becomes like we're uniquely, those in that community mm -hmm. sort of have this idea, they're uniquely broken or they're, they're special in their own way and they can't relate to other guys. So much of the counsel I give other guys is, yeah, you need to be honest about this and maybe find some others that are working that same journey with you. It's going to be so healing when you find out that you can relate to other guys who don't have the same background as you. Yes. And so you can get this reinforced that you're not uniquely broken. You're, you're broken like any other guy because we all have some sort of brokenness and mm -hmm. you have challenges that other guys have as well. It's not like there's different categories of man, straight guys and gay guys. That's right. And celibate gay guys or, you know, struggling gay guys. No, all guys. Yeah. Put them all together. And so it, that's powerful. It was, it was incredible to me, like having, you know, spending so much time with people who didn't struggle that about one in four of each of those men had been molested by an older male as a, as a boy. Hmm. I found out later that the general population, one out of every five adult men was molested by an older male as a boy. I thought, well, gosh, if they've had more gay sex than I've had, then what right do I have to demand that people treat me special or to think of me special? Like these guys have left it behind. Why can't I? And um, it was such a healing thing to be able to talk with straight guys who had, were still dealing with fantasy issues, were still dealing with these other issues, but had decided of their own free will that they were going to continue on in life and they were going to have families and they were going to be content in their marriages. And I got to see the fruit of these men who had moved on. Um, so by the time um, th the ministry had begun, when I went to Hope for Wholeness the first time, it was such a relational conference. It was incredible. 
I mean, the first thing that happened to me was this wonderful um, former lesbian lady. I'm just putting it out there like that. But this wonderful Christian lady was like, I just feel like I want to give you a hug. And she gave that was my welcome into Hope for Wholeness. <laughs> and I had never met her before, but she just wanted to like hug me. And um, that's really how the Lord is. He comes in tenderly and gently and corrects us and gives us the healing. Um, so it was such a huge blessing. Um, but yeah, we, I had, I, I really enjoyed my life. I was working full time. Um, I had kind of the white picket fence life and I was married with three small kiddos and, um, had a house and debt paid and things like that. Mm. And the Lord started, um, is it okay if I talk about how the ministry started? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a good segue right into it. Okay. Um, so I would bow my head to pray for my food, and I would see this man's face. And um, for about a couple months, I kept seeing this man's face. And one night, the Lord got me up. We were, I was talking with the Lord, and about 7 in the morning, he's like, now I want you to go find this man. And this was a guy I had met four years prior once in a town two hours away. So my, my wife comes into the room and I said, Hey, I'm going to go find this man today. And my wife's like, well, does he know you're coming? And I was like, Nope, I'm just going to go. And she, by this point, we know we were relying on Jesus enough that she was like, be obedient, you know, just go. So, um, I was in between jobs that week and I drove down, um, found him and he had a box of materials waiting for me. And they were all these ex-gay books, basically. And um, he's like, yeah, so when did you want to get an ex-gay ministry? And I was like, uh, I never did. Like, I'm just here because God said to show up and I'll help. I'll volunteer for the day. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. Tell me your story. So I tell him the story and he's like, just take the box back with you. So I brought the box home. And two weeks later, people started calling my personal cell phone. Now, I, I did not tell people my story. I was not fully in the life. I didn't hold an identity. I was not, you know, open about all of that. So when people started calling my personal cell phone, I was like, oh, oh my gosh, like this is the Lord. So I would meet up with people and give them the books from the box I had been given. And that's how our ministry in North um, Florida began. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Who was that guy? It was Mark Culligan. He's the director of New oh, Hearts yeah. Outreach in Tampa. Director of what? New Hearts Outreach in Tampa. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah. See, God's got this network, man. <laughs> Even the ones that aren't uh, registered as 501c3s. This yeah. God has his own secret network. <laughs> it's true. There's no overcoming the Lord's plans. Yeah. So that's how also you weren't even, you weren't even planning it. This God started bringing people your way. Yeah. I mean, I was just doing life working. Yep. And uh, yeah, Jan- it was January 25th, 2014 when that happened. Wow. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's another thing I want to follow up with, with one of the things you shared. Um, when you would open up to people, well, well, there's one contrast with what the narrative typically is, is that when you share with people that you struggle with same sex attraction, that uh, you were going to, you face condemnation and rejection. No, instead what you got was thank you for sharing. That's so brave. Um, so not the typical narrative that we hear, which yes. is out there. I know plenty of people who have had the narrative of being rejected. Yes. But you also have another narrative that I've also heard from plenty of people like, oh, thank you for sharing that. That's so brave of you. And then no follow-up. Yes. And I want to contrast that with what I think is ultimately what is offered to us through the side B gay Christianity movement. And that is that that sort of, oh, thank you for sharing. It's You're so brave. Why am I so brave for sharing that? In their perspective, the reason you're brave for sharing that is because you're a marginalized person because of your same-sex attraction. It means that you are a gay person. I'm not saying that these were the individuals were thinking that you shared with, but I think the advice from the revoice camp, 
side B gay Christianity, even the celibate gay Christianity, would be that it's brave to share that because you're not welcome in the larger church community. So you're marginalized by simply being same-sex attracted. And so it's very brave, but there's no sense of, well, what are you going to do about it? It's just, okay, how can we comfort you and a, sort of accommodate for you being a single gay Christian now? Because yes. that's just going to be your cross you're going to have to bear. Yes. Instead, you were challenged by your future wife to yes. take responsibility for it. Now what are you going to do? Yes. And we don't hear that call enough, at least not from the, what is increasingly more popular in the evangelical world, is just to treat them like some sort of class of marginalized people within our church and show mostly kind of like pity on them. No, yeah. you were like, no, do something about it. Well, something kind of incredible about my wife too was you know, she had her own personal story where she had to rely on Jesus and she really saw a lot of value in the church. So she wasn't the type to belittle the church to make me feel better either. You know, she saw that there was value having been completely lost um, and not knowing the Lord at all. And then coming into the church, seeing so much value there that, you know, gets overlooked nowadays. Um, she wouldn't have been the person to say, you know, those other Christians may not be nice, but I'm going to be the nice one and kind of vilifying the rest of the church. She she saw the value that the church had to offer instead of, you know, maybe just the weaknesses or mistakes that some people have made. And um, and her focus was on the Lord, which is where it should be. Yeah. Um, and I, like you said, I think a lot of people, they kind of project what other Christians might think. And they're trying to protect you from these imaginary people or these very less people than are being represented. Yeah. Um, and so it, I'm so grateful that she spoke up and helped me to take responsibility. Um, yeah. It's very empowering. I left feeling like there was something that I could do, um, not ne to necessarily fix my same sex attractions, but that maybe God would honor my obedience in some way. Mm -hmm. And um and two, you know, when you go to a Christian, you expect community and understanding, but also guidance. And that's something that I feel like is missing in this compassionate Christianity without any guidance, um, just the dialogue or the conversation. People go to Christ and the church for guidance, too. And I needed that, certainly. And I, would, I would actually reject the premise that the accommodation approach is compassionate because it's actually just an easy cop out just to say oh i feel sorry for you and uh how can we make church more comfortable for you as a single person even though that's necessary we do need to be mindful of those who are different stages of of life and have different relationship statuses but mm -hmm. that's neglecting the fact that someone has same-sex attraction there's likely some really serious wounding in their life when we buy into the idea that people are just born that way, then we just, we don't even consider that. We just mm -hmm. think, well, that's just how they are. And now we need to make them comfortable. No, there's more to it than that. There must be some degree of brokenness and disorder, or some dysfunction to have even got them to that place. How can I, as a true brother and sister, help provide the healing that God wants to bring? And it's an easy cop out. It's just, it was the least effort I could put in just to make things easier for you to stay in the state you're in it's much more challenging to walk a lot alongside someone and get in the trenches with them mm -hmm. so i can see from that part of your story as well as the part of your story where you shared about getting out of the ex-gay group and going around other guys that i see how that must have really informed the way you set up identify ministries to help people get involved in a local church find accountability and discipleship and then disciple the disciplers to be effective. It's yeah. getting them involved in the healing community that they need. Well, I think too, you know, we have Daniel on here who's been running groups forever. Um, but a lot of people in the, com in the compassionate without guidance camp, that's kind of the way I think about it or the, um, that kind of minority status camp. Yeah. Um, a lot of them have never actually discipled someone through for years or seen the long-term effects of what they've done. Um, they 
you know, it's that's the privilege of writing a book or being a speaker is it's one and done. And when you have someone, you know, exemplified by Daniel here, who's done this for years, who's walked with families and individuals for years, he can really see the fruit of his discipleship and um, and the stability that it brings. And that's it is so important that we we know the fruit of those we are listening to. Um, and Rosaria Butterfield wrote uh, an article about you are what you read. And the mm-hmm. truth is, you want to know who that author is. Is that author successful at discipling people out of LGBTQ? Or do they just have a new premise that is experimental that we're reading that sounds like it would work or that provides an immediate benefit, but no long term benefit? Yeah. You know, so maybe yeah. like Daniel could pipe in and, you know, say what he's seen in that. I often describe when I'm talking to Christians about what I do in ministry, I often describe that it's simply discipling, um, that it's that it's helping birth someone in something in someone who usually is already born again, but has no idea what, what God has for them what the possibilities are even. Um, I, I, starting the beginning of June, I will have completed 20 years of ministry. And usually in, in, our, in our overcomers group, we have anywhere from seven to 12 guys. And uh, currently there are seven. But two of those seven have been with me since 2004. And they've, they've stayed because not only do they continue to benefit from what we're doing, but they've also seen the benefit of pouring into other guys who have come along behind them, who become part of the group, the overcomers group. And pouring into their lives from their own experience, what God's done in them. So it's important for us to to have that generational, so to speak, um, input and impact on people coming in who are just now discovering that, as the old book says, you don't have to be gay. Yeah. Now, maybe that would... uh be a good opportunity to maybe share a bit about that sign behind you. Cause I, I think that might connect to what you just shared there, Daniel. Now there's two signs. You're probably talking about the one that says journey. Mm-hmm. The one underneath it says, choose this day whom you will serve mm. for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. And that's part of the message too. This isn't just a, uh, I'm coming to Jesus and he's going to fix everything moment. It doesn't, it, it, it may have worked that way for a few people, but, but as far as LGBTQ issues is concerned, but that's not the way most of us, the overwhelming majority of us have had to deal with learning to overcome our attractions, manage our attractions, walk away from the sin. Uh, it's a process. It's a journey. It really is a journey. It's, it's and it's not just a journey away from all things LGBTQ. It's a journey towards everything God has for us in Christ. Mm-hmm. Amen. So let's let's get into it then, you guys. The, so for the both of you guys, uh, to share a little bit more about the history of this new network. Transformation Ministries Alliance. Uh, I know it's it's a newer ministry, but it's also got some history. So, Dana, why, why don't you start off with sort of the background? Well, when Exodus International closed in 2013, there was a fellow who was leading uh, a local ministry in South Carolina who uh, had been there for several years, and the Lord put it in his heart to start a new network. Uh, and named it Hope for Wholeness. 
And that name came from a curriculum, uh, a video curriculum that this fellow had put together um, to help people um, in their overcoming process. Mm -hmm. Hope for Holdus became a network. And he was told at the time by the fellow who was shutting down uh, Exodus International that that was an answer to prayer. So Hope for Wholeness started. My involvement in it um, was kind of an, just a natural flow of Exodus shutting down. Uh, I was asked to be on the board of the Hope for Wholeness Network, um, and I stayed on its board until it closed. Um, the reason its, its closure um, happened in 2017 um, when that fellow who had founded it um, wasn't was going off in his own direction and wasn't um, adequately for the board's purposes um, keeping things going uh, in a in a godly direction and a direction that was going to be helpful for the people who were depending on that network to help sustain their walk in the Lord. So uh, we decided as a board to uh, receive that individual's resignation. And it looked like for a short period of time that I may be taking over the leadership of that network until a new director could be named. Um, rather than do that, the board um, decided that we wanted to take some time to set up a set of requirements and eligibility and and uh, uh, just set up some some foundation for having and hiring a new uh, executive director because the executive director we had from the time it started founded it and there was never a need to draw those things up. Wow. Unfortunately, because the board as it was, was scattered throughout the country and we had other jobs and ministries that we were doing, it took us two and a half years to accomplish that. Um, so by the time we finally did hire someone, two and a half years had passed, which brought us to September of 2019. We hired that individual, and then five months later, that individual decided, this is not for me. That took us to the beginning of 2020. In It was January of 2020. And the board of directors needed to decide, okay, are we going to take the time now that we have these things in place to, to, for a, a new executive director? Uh, are we going to take the time to do this again? The chairman of the board said, I don't have the bandwidth to continue with this. Uh, he had another ministry going that he needed to, to stay involved with. Uh, to make a long story short, I was the only one out of those seven people who both wanted to see something else raised up, but also stick around to make it happen. So the Hope for Wholeness Board uh, voted to send all of its resources to my ministry, Abba's Delight, for the purpose of me starting a new network. Mm. That's how Transformation Ministries Alliance got started. I pulled together a completely new board of directors. Uh, the Lord directed me to an attorney uh, who, here in Kentucky, who specializes in uh, not-for-profits. And uh, we put together a new network called Transformation Ministries Alliance, a name that the Lord gave me, just like he had given me the name Allah's Delight when I started that one. Um, and uh, the new board began meeting uh, in 2020. I believe it was in August of 2020, when we had our first organizational meeting. 
um, the Lord had put on my heart um, from the very start uh, that Derek should be the executive director to take over because my assignment was always get it up, get it running. And once you have a new executive director, your assignment would be complete. Hmm. So we brought Derek on uh, after a rigorous, long interview process um, because I knew he was the Lord's choice, but the other members of the board needed to also believe he is the Lord's choice. Mm -hmm. uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't good enough or right for them just to take my word for it. They had to, they had to believe that this was what God was saying as well. Uh, so we brought Derek on. Um, we continued to have regular meetings uh, moving forward to continue to get ourselves established as a network. And so uh, in October of 2022, we had made plans to uh, – have a, a an event, a luncheon event uh, that Derek was planning uh, at just prior to the uh, Atlanta Freedom March, and we were we had arranged to have a table. Derek had arranged. I'm I'm trying not to tell too much of your story here, Derek. Um, that that uh, we were gonna have a, a table established there, uh, an exhibit table, uh, so that we could you know, uh, get people to know about it. And we also had this luncheon. We had a board meeting just prior to the luncheon. Mm -hmm. And the Lord had spoken to my heart a few weeks before that, Daniel, your assignment is complete. So at that board meeting, I resigned my chairman of the board position. I said, I will be available to help in whatever way you need help. Um, but as far as taking a, continuing with an executive type of leadership in this organization, the Lord has said, my, my assignment is complete. Mm. So I resigned as of that day. And so our vice chair took over as, as the board chair. Uh, and then Derek had already been doing such a wonderful job of the everyday stuff in, in doing the network, the network um, that they just took over from there. And I just kind of withdrew. There you go. Passing all the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Derek, anything else to add about uh, getting involved with TMA and, and taking over the leadership there? Yeah, well, one of the things that I had always appreciated about the previous network, T first of all, TMA is a completely new network. And um, we have such incredible leadership. Um, it really is a leadership team. Our board is a team and works together. Uh, we had, you know, such wonderful founding. Um, one of the things that we recognized with what Hope for Wholeness provided was very much a relational atmosphere and um, kind of an interdenominational coming together um, for the hope and faith of seeing how much God could change us in his time, in his way, um, amongst like brethren. And, um, and so TMA has... Um, come along that same, very same line. And it's been wonderful to work with the board. The board is growing. Um, Daniel, it was obviously his calling to set up um, this board and to found this network. 
And uh, they are a joy to work with, easy to work with. Everyone has a role and um, just works as a team. Um, but yeah, on my side of things in 2019, I had felt called only to apply for the directorship with Hope for Wholeness. And, um, and so I did that. And my personal feeling is that the person who um, who ended up being the director, um, she is a very strong spiritual person that she was called to be there for that time. And um, about the time that she was hired, the Lord stopped me in my room when I was walking through my room one day and um, said, you know, Derek, do you want to just, you know, be in, in charge of North Florida or do you feel called to do something bigger? And um, that was something that I had been wrestling with for months. And I said, Lord, um, if the director is removed or steps down and a board member reaches out to me about applying, then I'll know that it was you and that's how you want me to worship you. And so a few months later, um, that process began and I started to realize, well, if this is how the Lord wants to be worshiped through service, then this is the personal calling that I have for this time. And, um, and so it, it does feel like a calling. It definitely is a calling. I'm grateful. I get to see um, the wondrous hand of the Lord and the lives of not just overcomers who are getting ministered to, but all of those impacted by um, ministries like this, parents, pastors, counselors, um, it's incredible to see how God puts things together. And um, and so I'm really honored to be in a role like this. And we do have this upcoming conference um, at the Ark Encounter called Epic Transformation. It's all about platforming transformation. Um, TMA, for short, um, we are focused on providing transformational speakers, guiding ministries, counselors, pastors, directly to the transformational resources, and then providing ministry support. Uh, as some people know, when they try to start a ministry like this um, with DEI initiatives and other programs, um, they're discriminatory by nature. So it's really hard for someone with a testimony to get insurance for their growing nonprofit or church that's transformational. It's hard for them to get bank accounts. It's hard for them um, to find counseling. It's hard for them. And um, they need someone to come alongside them and expedite uh, transformational ministry. And so that's what TMA does. We come alongside ministers and counselors and ministries, overcomers themselves, and help guide them um, to the authentic Jesus, authentic long-term transformation and um, get them on their way. If they need some support, we can be there for them. Good. Uh, so that's actually a good segue. I'm curious if you can uh, describe a little bit more. What are, what are some of the things that make Transformation Ministries Alliance unique? What, what are the distinctives? Because we got, you know, when X is closed, we also had Restored Hope Network that started a year prior. Yes. And yes. Hope for Wholeness started. So what's the difference, if there are any, and uh, what are some things that can be unique about the conference as well? Yeah, you know, there are benefits and strengths and weaknesses to everything. Um, you know, the two main organizations that came out of Exodus, the two main ones were Restored Hope and Hope for Wholeness. Um, both are transformational networks, um, but have different feels to them. And um, TMA, um, kind of preserving some of the great things out of Hope for Wholeness, um, is known for dynamic worship, um, is known for being um, very approachable and casual. You, when you come to one of our events, there are going to be people with tie-dye shirts and flip-flops all the way to people with suit coats on. And um, that's the way we like it. We like people to come as they are. Um, we're very relational. A lot of our workshops and speakers um, are very like humble and authentic and put flesh on <laughs> the stories and the theology that we like to hear about. And so um, you're going to experience um, transformation at our events. Uh, we believe in education, but we also want people to experience um, God at our events for themselves. 
in a very real way for them. Mm. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go into the conference a little bit more. Uh, what should people expect? What You also have kind of a conference within a conference there. You have a leadership portion. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that's limited to those that were only invited to that. But then you also have the general conference. Uh, what For people who are going to one or either or both, what can they expect? For sure. And stuff? So first, no, like one of our goals is we would love for no matter where someone lives or attends that they could turn around and find a ministry or a transformational church ministry or counselor. That's what we want to see. Um, so we actually have a leadership portion that is to expedite membership where someone can learn about what TMA is about. They can interview the board themselves um, and then they can choose to apply. And by the end of the conference, they can find out if they have an invitation for membership. So that's a lot of what our leadership portion is about. The other half of that is um, we want to provide them immediate resources um, that have stood the test of time. So we're going to talk about attitude of effective ministry, um, what it looks like, what are some hangups that people have found in the past that um, make ministry more difficult so that can be avoided, and what are some immediate resources they can employ in their ministry um, that will provide you know, the long-term results that they're looking for. And um, in our general conference, this is more for um, a general Christian audience. Um, we actually have speakers that talk about a bunch of things. Our opening keynote is Avery Foley from Answers in Genesis. She's going to talk about the biblical backing for what we're seeing in the world today and for transformational theology, what God expects in marriage and gender and sex. And um, in all of our classes, workshops, speakers, they are for an adult audience. Um, so she's going to open up our conference. We have a former lesbian stud as one of our keynote speakers who's had a deliverance experience, but also was discipled for years. Uh, we have, and that's Taisha Holt. Uh, we have a former gay man, Guy Hammond from Canada, who will be speaking about his personal testimony, what God has done and what he's continuing to do. And then we have um, Brandon Showalter from the Christian Post, who has worked extensively this last year to expose what happens within a family when this kind of transgender agenda asserts itself in between the parent and the child. So this is going to be um, a unifying conference um, where people can open up, they can talk about what they're going through. And it's not just for the ex-gay person. This mm -hmm. is for everybody that's on the same page um, to get to know each other, um, to network, and to be there for each other after the conference is over. Yes. So what do you guys see as uh, a vision for the future of this these types of ministries in general, but also in particular for TMA? Sure. Well, Daniel, I'll let you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, wow, that's, that's a difficult question. In the end, God reigns. Amen. In the end, Jesus is still king. And whether, whether that means that efforts to, to um, forcibly do away or lawfully do away with ministries and networks like what we're doing happen, Jesus has a way to bring redemption to the LGBTQ population. Amen. Whatever, whatever the enemy has in mind, it may work in the natural, but God works both in the natural and the supernatural. And the, and the enemy is going to lose no matter what. So, you know, I would, I would love to see ministries continue as they are. Um, I, I've testified before a committee uh, here in the state of Kentucky and have spoken with people of, of members of Congress and their aides about some of the laws that are being passed to try and get uh, ministries like ours shut down and stopped 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I think as the church, w- the ministries and networks that we have are a part of the overall body of Christ. We are um, we are considered uh, parachurch ministries. And as part of as part of the body of Christ, uh, I think it's so important for us to continue doing what we're doing, not be fearful and not shy away. Uh, and it's important for the message to continue to get out. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm turning 71. I don't know how long the Lord is going to keep me going doing what, what he's called me to do, but I'm in it for as long a haul as he's got me here. And I, while my body may slow down, um, my heart and whatever else is in me is going to keep going to do what he's called me to do. And every opportunity I get, I encourage other ministry leaders to do the same because it's so important for us uh, in these days that we continue uh, what the Lord is doing in the earth. We continue that work. He's chosen to use mere mortal, faulty, messed up members of the body of Christ to continue the work that he desires to see done to get his kingdom established here on earth. And it's important for us to continue to do that. Yes. Um, By the way, Derek, you are doing an amazing job. Mm. I'm so pleased I'm just sitting here smiling my face off to <laughs> listen to you talk. There is such an anointing on you to do what you're doing. Thanks. I just need to say that to you. Yeah. I'll tell you again when I see you in person. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can tell why everyone loves Daniel so much. Mm-hmm. Um, Daniel is like the godfather of authentic Christian ministry. And um, when we would get together at Hope for Wholeness, um, he would just like hug us and speak words of encouragement over us. And that was something that was really unique that he brought to that ministry and is bringing to TMA. And um, there's, when I say there's a relational atmosphere, that's what you see in him and the way he treats me. Um, is the way that we want everyone to be treated who comes to TMA. And um, there is no difference between the keynote speakers and those who are attending for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, We love them and we will be there for them. And so, yeah, I just, it's important for people to see and understand there's been such a vilification of the authentic church Um, that people are afraid to know what transformation looks like. They're afraid to know what an authentic mentor looks like. And, um, and they shouldn't be afraid. Um, I, you know, you asked about the vision of XK ministry and really, you know, one thing we can be assured of is it will not always look the same. And we're going to honor the Lord with our worship in this ministry, regardless of um, how Satan comes against us or people who are lost, who just don't know, come against us. Um, but what would it look like? I think it would be a beautiful thing. Um, let me give you an example. So ev- most people now are aware of, um, Sam Brinton mm-hmm. and kind of the controversy going on with him. And, you know, we honestly pray for his soul. Um, how many of the people at our ministries were fresh out of the life and needed redemption. And so we pray in the name of Jesus that there would be a radical transformation with him, just like there is for everybody else, um, and especially how there has been for us. Um, However, um, Sam has been an example of um, a tie to the Trevor Project. And if you look at their IRS funding um, or their IRS form, you see that they brought in over $50 million in a year 
And, um, and it's really hard for um, ministries like ours to compete with, you know, that much money funneling to one organization, one nonprofit. And um, it would be a beautiful thing if the people who had sacrificed, invested their lives in their education for the gospel um, were able to get similar funding. And there was a flip-flop to where instead of the government funneling money to only certain things they deem appropriate, if the body of Christ would rise up and that they would um, they would be faithful with their giving to ministries all across this country. Um, it would be my hope that there would be at least two strong ministries in every major city mm. and, um, and that there would be a network of counselors, not just across this country, but the world. Um, that are willing to risk it all for Jesus Christ, that are the most highly educated possible, um, and that the the pastors would be completely reliant on the word of God and um, and have a faith for everyone to see transformation, whether it's for their own nephew or child or for one of their congregation members. Um, so yeah, I would hope and pray for a flip-flop of funds to God's kingdom um, that we would see the goodness of the Lord restored in our communities, that the churches would be doing 90% or more of the sexual redemptive work, and that uh, we would have ministries all over this country and beyond in every major city um, mm. possible. That's right. Aim yeah. big. To, to kind of highlight what Derek talked about, about the, you know, the, the need for more ministries, Take Abba's Delight, for instance. I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky. I am the only, Abba's Delight is the only ministry in the state of Kentucky and in the southern half of Indiana. Would wow. Be, would be the closest. Um, and it's like that all over the country. And the, yes. the uh, I think the assumption would be that there'd be all sorts of ex-gay ministries and ex-gay yeah, and uh, conversion therapy camps all over Kentucky and the Bible Belt and all that, right? It's a, and yet you're the only one? And, and Kentucky's a long state. So, yeah. geez, man. And he said before, he's providing Christian discipleship. This isn't mysterious stuff here. Yeah. You know, he's providing good, reliable Christian care. Um, it just shows for us to get that vision that you have there, Derek, the church really needs to shed itself of the propaganda. This, the scales need to fall off people's eyes that they have regarding this type of ministry, that yeah. it's dangerous, it's harmful, it's quackery. It's uh, uh, just based off of behavior management or shaming people or all this bunk that people have fallen for. The church needs to get do the digging, realize, oh, my gosh, we've been fed lies. Why don't we get to the truth? And then let's put our money where our mouth is. We say that we believe in a God who redeems people, who uh, makes us born from above, We're born again. Mm -hmm. We are new creations. And we need to be nurtured in that. The church is supposed to be what edifies and build up the body. Well, there's people with sexual struggles that need to be built up and re-edified because they've been poorly nurtured before. Let's put our money where our mouth is and support ministries that have been on the ground for years doing the Lord's work. And let's not treat them like pariahs like the rest of the world is treating them. Amen. So pray the world, the, the church overall gets convicted of that and gets inspired and so I pray for a good outpouring Amen. at the conference and everything else that the different ministries out there are doing. It's about time we get the uh, support we really need. So. That's right. That's true. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time. This has been a delight. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you guys so much. Yeah. So I'm just going to uh, uh, give you guys an opportunity real quick. Uh Daniel, if people want to find out more uh, about your ministry, where would they go and how can they contact you? Abbasdelight.com. Good. Simple as that. Yeah. Derek? Yeah. If they want to find out about the upcoming conference at the ARC, they can go to tmacorp.org backslash events or just go to tmacorp.org. All right. And about identify? Sure. Our website is identifyministries.org. They can go to the contact us page, um, see the procedure of how to get involved, and we'll reach back out to them. All right. Well, once again, guys, thank you so much. It was an honor to have you guys on. 
I'm just going to sign off. To everyone who's been watching, I pray you've been blessed. And look into these ministries. Look into the conference. Until next time, please know that Jesus loves you freely, fully, faithfully, and fruitfully.